Hello, and a very warm welcome to you from wherever you are in the world today. Thanks for joining us at the Global Disability Innovation Hub, also known as GDI Hub. And for today's Disability Innovation Lecture, we're delighted to be joined by UCL Honorary Professor Sujatha Sirinathan Varsan, beg your pardon, from the India Institute of Technology, Madras. Before we start, I'll begin by introducing myself and summarising the format for today's lecture. My name is Nadine and I'm the Communications Manager here at GDI Hub. Um, for a sensory description, I'm a black woman of indeterminate age. I'm wearing eyeglasses and a green jumper and green scarf. Online, we're joined by Jane, who will be providing live captions throughout today's session. The format for today's lecture begins with a presentation from Sujatha of approximately 45 minutes, followed by Q&A for the remaining time until the end at 2 p.m. Please feel free to post any questions during um, the session by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Um, pop them there at any time and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Professor Sajafa to begin today's lecture. Over to you. Thank you, Nadine, uh, and hello to everyone who is joining us today. My lecture is uh, entitled uh, Innovation for Inclusion, and I will talk about uh, our journey in assistive device development. I had two centers at IIT Madras. One is R2D2, the TTK Center for Rehabilitation Research and Device Development which focuses on R&D of assistive devices. And we also have a new center called the National Center for Assistive Health Technologies, where we focus more on awareness creation, uh, tr uh, training programs for clinical profession professionals, as well as training for uh, wheelchair skills. Very happy to be here uh, today. Uh, and I'll take you through our journey in essentially developing devices for people with uh, uh, locomotor disability. So we work on both, I'm a mechanical engineer, and we work on both rehabilitation and assistive devices uh, because the need for uh, the motivation for our work comes from the fact that in India alone, there are over 30 million people who are affected by locomotor disability. And you know, as per the WHO estimates, we know that only 10% of those who need assistive uh, products have access to them. And the need is even greater in uh, low and middle income countries. So we work on a combination, we work, we look at biomechanics, we look at uh, mechanism and machine design, and we use principles from those to develop uh, uh, assistive devices assistive and uh, rehabilitation devices. So here in this figure, I'm showing you a picture of uh, a standing wheelchair, a prosthetic foot, and a swimming pool lift that will help people with the locomotor disability uh, get into and out of a pool. So if you look at the spectrum of assistive devices that are available, on the one hand, you have very primitive devices like a you know, hospital grade wheelchair, a locked orthotic knee, or uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, device for hand rehabilitation, like, you know, with rubber bands, uh, which are very simple, uh, low cost, but they may be too simple to be functional. On the other end of the spectrum, you have very sophisticated high tech devices. Uh, you can have like microprocessor controlled knees, you can have uh, uh, exoskeletons, you can have self-balancing wheelchairs. But if you look at uh, the history of these products, um, many of them have not even been able to make it from the lab to the market. Uh, 
And even if somebody can afford them here, maintenance is a problem. Maintenance and repair becomes a huge problem. So at R2D2, what we are focused on is to develop more functional, at the same time, high quality and affordable devices. And we use an interdisciplinary approach uh, towards this, you know, with uh, inputs from uh, engineers of different kinds, uh, different disciplines, uh, clinicians, end users, other stakeholders uh, like uh, caregivers even. So uh, we've developed so far, we've commercialized four products. One is a polycentric uh, prosthetic knee for people with above knee amputation, amputations, an active wheelchair, um, a motorized add-on that converts it into a roadworthy vehicle and a manually operated standing wheelchair. And I'll talk about each of those uh, uh, today. So we, our development starts with identifying the need uh, because that we believe is the most important uh, aspect. We want to solve real problems, not problems that we think is uh, exciting to be solved because the technology is exciting. Um, so we identify needs, then we develop the design requirements, then we follow the iterative process of uh, going through uh, the literature, looking at existing devices, uh, conceptual design, synthesis, prototyping, mechanical testing, user trials. And what differentiates us from most academic institutions is that not only do we patent and publish our work, Typically, we want to at least get to a pre-commercial prototype, which we then uh, you know, work with an industry partner to commercialize. We follow this collaboration model. We've developed this model, which has been published. It's called the GRID collaboration model. And uh, we've used this model to commercialize the devices. So it's essentially, it has four pillars. G stands for grants, which we either create, get from the government or uh, corporate social responsibility grants from private uh, industries. Uh, we do the research either by ourselves or in partnership with other research institutions. And the development is with a focus on function with scientific rigor, uh, not just uh, based on the bottom line. Uh, so we are able to do that as an academic institution. We bring together industry partners, which could be established players or a startup and we have dissemination partners who are involved with us right from the beginning, be it the end user uh, or other stakeholders in the chain, uh, for example, clinical professionals. And um, so we use these partners to not only help uh, co-create with us, but also for the ex extensive trials that are needed to ensure a user-centric design. And they also act as brand ambassadors later. So one of the first projects we worked on was a standing wheelchair. So as I said, you know, the need, why a standing wheelchair? So there's a white paper that was published by the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America um, in 2013 that clearly established the need for standing on a regular basis for people who use wheelchairs. It established the health benefits of doing so. And it also indicated that people who are not able to stand on a regular basis can develop contractures, pressure sores, and other secondary health problems. Therefore, they determined that standing as therapy is very important for people uh, who have to use wheelchairs for a large portion of their uh, time uh, to prevent and to preserve their health. Uh, I'll now play a short video that shows what a typical therapeutic standing session looks like. In 2012, I met with a road accident. Post that, uh, we noticed my spine got a severe injury. So after a surgery, I am using wheelchair. Suddenly, a fraction of a second, I lost my walking ability. So it's very hard time for me and uh, my family as well. Life in a wheelchair can be eventful. Day-to-day -day aspects of mobility demand effort and assistance, often leaving paraplegics and their caregivers overwhelmed. 
Hours of sitting in a wheelchair can cause secondary health problems to the user like poor blood circulation and reduced bone density, among other issues. My love injury people definitely need a physiotherapy few days in a week. So it will avoid our uh, big sore and all. So our leg get a uh, uh, spasm otherwise. So the video showed a person with a spinal cord injury uh, being helped by two people. You know, he has to wear uh, braces, which will help him stand in a standing frame. And he has to be lifted by two people to be positioned in the standing frame and then bolted in into the standing frame so that he can undergo therapy for a few minutes every day. It's a very laborious process. It's not something that uh, uh, fosters independence. Uh, and therefore, we came up with the design of our standing wheelchair. The concept of a standing wheelchair has been around, uh, and it has benefits in the sense that um, it's the standing mechanism is integrated into the wheelchair, and therefore, and it can be operated by the person with minimal hand effort. So there is a lot of engineering uh, that goes into designing a device like this. There's a lot of mechanical engineering. We use gas springs to perform some kind of uh, spring balancing to reduce the effort required. We also built in a lot of customizability uh, into the design so that it could still be mass manufactured because one size will not fit all uh, for such a device. And therefore we were cognizant of that and incorporated all that into the uh, design of the standing wheelchair. What we were able to do is uh, uh, what differentiated our design from some things that were out there is one, we were able to make it very, very affordable. This standing wheelchair retails for about uh, $600 uh, or I should say 300 pounds, um, you know, which is most imported uh, devices are at least uh, are several times uh, the, that price. And we also built in some safety features that are uh, make it more uh, suitable. So if you don't have the knee block in place, then the standing will not happen. Uh, so we found things to improve upon, uh, but, but it was a long journey. So this is a figure that shows, you know, our journey from the concept stage, which was in 2011, when this was given as just a mechanisms class project to when it became a product in 2019, um, you know, with the help of an industry partner. So this was our first, the grid model evolved out of this journey uh, of the standing wheelchair. So the grant was from Welcome in the UK. Uh, R2D2 was the uh, uh, research uh, uh, part. I mean, R2D2 did the research on this. Uh, we had an industry partner, a medical devices company that took it to market. And we had several organizations, several individuals uh, who along the course of the development uh, participated in the uh, co-creation and helped us come up with a user-centric design that was suitable for Indian conditions, especially in rural areas where the terrain can be quite challenging. We have uh, several uh, publications uh, as a result of this uh, work, starting from work on the spring balancing to the design journey, to the uh, mechanical design of the chair, um, as well as a user experience study that uh, we conducted uh, on this chair. And not only that, we are now, we've now tracked users over the course of a year and we have an impact assessment study of this uh, device in community use and the manuscript is under review right now. So we want to see this journey through. We want to go through the entire cycle. So as we were doing the uh, trials for the standing wheelchair, we came across an interesting problem. We found that most people had some very cheap low cost wheelchairs that they could use for indoor mobility. But because of the challenges of the terrain outdoors, they would not be able to go outdoors with it. And if they wanted to go outdoors, they would have to transfer 
to either a tricycle or a tri-scooter. And the transfer process itself is a dangerous one because they'd have, you know, the tri-scooter and the tricycle have pretty uh, seats that are located uh, uh, pretty high. So we came up with the idea of uh, a better wheelchair, which is more customizable, uh, which would be a more active uh, wheelchair. And we came up with this idea of an add-on to that device, a motorized add-on that would convert it into a roadworthy vehicle. So I will now play another video. And that was the birth of our startup, uh, Neomotion, which again followed the grid model. We had funding from the government as well as from private uh, players, uh, the corporate social responsibility funding. And Neomotion was the industry partner because they were the people who worked on the design from the beginning. And uh, we partnered again with the uh, uh, some user groups and um, some individual users to co-create the device. So I'll play this video. My 2011 was fallen down in my hand because of my body was paralyzed. After using this wheelchair, we can go anywhere and come anywhere. We are working on this project for a year. It's the best India design wheelchair that I've sat on in 27 years. पहले हम बिल्चर से हम जो मराठन करते थे उसमें बहुत ज़्यादा समय लगता था इस बिल्चर के प्रयोग करने के बाद टाइमिंग है वो बहुत कम हो गया एक गाड़ी आती है जो कि इस बिल्चर में आसानी से हम सेट कर सकते हैं और गाड़ी सेट करने के बाद हम आसानी से बाहर जा सकते हैं कम स्पेस में जा सकते हैं और कहीं भी पार्किंग See, I have a car that, uh, that I drive, uh, it's hand-operated, uh, but often the challenges that I face uh, in terms of mobility is somebody to get your wheelchair, somebody to, you know, kind of load it, or even going to my parents' place, uh, you know, is a huge challenge. My parents' place is only five minutes away, but I'll still have to take the car. With this, I just, you know, roll my wheelchair out, put the bolt on, straight away go there, and then get the bolt on out, get into the lift and go to my parents' place. Today when I uh, was uh, riding this, uh, the feeling of the air coming and hitting on my face, I think that that's the true sign of freedom and liberation. To go to the grocery shop or to the supermarket, now my wife is going to kick my backside and I have no excuses absolutely. So that was uh, the Neo Fly and the Neo Bolt. Um, the Neo Fly is a wheelchair and the user can um, bolt on essentially, just attach the motorized device uh, quickly and go on different kinds of terrain. Uh, that's what the video uh, demonstrated. Um, so Neo Motion is now, they've, they're in the growth stage. They've moved past the, uh, I would say the valley of death. And uh, we have users across, uh, across India. Uh, and they now have a production facility. Um, they're able to, recently they were challenged to produce. They had an order that they had to, of 100 units that they had to fulfill in about a week and they managed to do that. Uh, so that's uh, the story of uh, Neo Motion. So what we have created at R2D2 is an ecosystem for innovating and um, you know, creating assistive devices for locomotive disability. Um, it's a unique R&D environment. We have created testing facilities here to test uh, wheelchairs to ISO standards, uh, as well as prosthetics and orthotics uh, to the ISO standards. And we want to provide assistive technologies as a career option. Some of my students have stayed back um, or others have joined and um, are working on startups uh, in this field. And we really want, we know that we can make an impact only when we take our prototypes to the market. Uh, so that's, that underlies the uh, uh, vision uh, of what we do here. But we've also realized at a point that just creating products is not uh, enough because the challenges are many and awareness is a huge 
uh, challenge in this space. So here's another uh, um, uh, product that we uh, created. If you look at walking, um, the knee plays an important role in walking. So during what is called the stand space, when the foot is on the ground uh, and the weight is being borne by the leg, the knee has to be stable. It should not buckle. Then in the swing phase, when the weight is off the leg, the knee has to bend and allow the leg to move forward to prepare for the next step. So the knee has uh, two conflicting roles uh, to play during walking. And if you look at existing knee joints, especially in a country like India where the terrain is uneven, uh, what tends to happen is the knee joints are simply locked. They're kept locked so that there is no chance of the person losing stability when they are weight bearing. But what this does is that when they are trying to swing their leg, they have to swing their leg from the hip, which leads to a very awkward gait. It leads to an energy inefficient gait. Uh, there are other kinds of knees also available, like a single axis knee, but that requires good muscular control. And there are also knees called polycentric knees, which have a moving uh, knee center, or they're also called four bar knees that are available. This technology has been around for decades, four bar knees. But when we started looking at, uh, you know, knees, uh, these four, four bar or polycentric knees, we found that all of them have very different geometries. And there was really no study that had looked at how these different geometries translate to biomechanical parameters and how they influence walking. And so that was the first thing we did. We looked at existing four bar knees out there and we identified certain parameters, excuse me, that we thought are important, uh, you know, both from the literature and from our experience uh, and conversations with uh, prosthetists. Uh, we looked at parameters that are important for use in Indian conditions, and we identified six of those. So you can see here a radar diagram which plots the how the different knees, the different geometries perform with respect to these six parameters. Now, a perfect knee would be something that would be the regular hexagon. But what you see is most of the, because the, knee, the uh, parameters are competing uh, parameters, uh, no knee meets all of them very well. So we worked on using optimization to see, to try to find the optimal knee that would match these parameters in the best possible way. And this was also something that we published. And um, we then used that to design uh, the uh, knee that we then transferred to uh, an industry partner. We did uh, several trials with Mobility India, and I'll now play a video of Kadam. this knee. Kadam has advantages over a hinge joint because of the multiple axes of rotation, which provide the user greater control over the prosthesis while walking and a maximum knee flexion of 160 degrees, which makes it easy to sit in cramped spaces like buses and autos. It is designed for durability with high strength stainless steel and aluminum alloy, along with hard chrome plated EN8 pins and high fatigue life polymer bushings. Kadam is India's first indigenously developed polycentric knee for an above knee prosthesis, AKP, under the Make in India campaign in association with Society for Biomedical Technology, SBMT. The knee is affordable and at the same time of high quality and performance, complying with ISO 10328 standards, including 30 lakh cycles of fatigue testing. It provides stability, reduces the risk of stumbling, and its patented geometry is specifically optimized for use on uneven terrains. Through Mobility India, extensive clinical trials have been conducted, the results of which have ensured the design is user-centric. Users 
instantly recognize the stable nature of the knee. The ability of the user to let go of the safety of parallel bars in the very first trial is a testimony to the performance of the knee. For thousands of above knee amputees in India, Kadam makes it possible to walk with a more comfortable gait. Not just mobility, Kadam aims to improve the overall quality of life of users, make them an integral part of the society, and instill confidence in such individuals to face the daily challenges in life. Kadam was developed uh, with Mobility India and was funded by the Society for Biomedical Technology. Mobility India also now is going to be one of the industry partners who's going to commercialize the device. Again, we have, you know, who would have thought that uh, four bar knee, which has been, um, which has been in use for decades would have so much opportunity for more research. We found, we were able to publish about five uh, papers uh, looking at uh, various aspects of the four bar knee, uh, of, uh, for bar knees in general, as well as our specific design, we were able to um, modify our design uh, based on the simulations that we did. We realized, for instance, that an extension assist is not really necessary uh, for uh, this knee, which made the design simpler and more uh, uh, cost effective. Uh, we also have a patent uh, on the knee. So you can see that there are outcomes, research outcomes also that come out of, uh, uh, of development of even seemingly simple uh, problems. The other aspect, you know, if you, if you look at the journey of a person who has had, um, uh, say, a spinal cord injury or an amputation, you know, mostly there's some level of hospitalization uh, then you have rehabilitation, probably have to uh, take some medication for a certain period of time. There is caregiving and there is assistive technology if you look at the uh, journey. In India, a crucial aspect that is uh, um, a challenge is rehabilitation. And you cannot enable health and independence through assistive devices without the appropriate rehabilitation. But the scarcity of trained healthcare professionals and access, uh, it makes it a big challenge and technology could provide a solution. So if you look at hand re neuro rehabilitation after a stroke, for instance, um, they use very simple devices like uh, here you see a person here uh, pulling um, a bar in a frame, which is spring loaded, which is providing resistance. They are pulling that repeatedly, or they are using their wrist to um, move a bar back and forth. Uh, so there are very passive tools that are used for rehabilitation, which provide little or no feedback. And this lack of feedback, you know, when the person is not able to see really how much, you know, first of all, it's a boarding task they're performing. Um, and um, it's not something uh, where they can really see improvement. Uh, so this, this leads to boredom and a poor adherence to the therapy. These are the traditional tools that are typically used. Then there are some other more sophisticated tools uh, you have what are called simple robots, which are designed for specific functions. They may be, but you would need different robots. So each robot may only uh, train one aspect of uh, hand movement. You have very complex robots, which can train multiple functions, but they're very complex and very few have been tested in clinics, clinical settings because they have not been translated from the lab uh, to clinical settings. So we set about designing Pluto. We wanted to simplify robots for hand therapy. And we took our inspiration from the kitchen blender where you have one motor and you may have different blades or jars for different purposes. Um, so we came up with uh, Pluto and Pluto is a hand neuro rehabilitation robot 
which uses a single motor that can be either mounted on a tabletop or on a stand. And then you have various attachments to Pluto that can be, which are passive attachments, which can train different aspects of hand movements. So I will now play a video about Pluto. This work we did in collaboration with the Christian Medical College uh, and Hospital CMC Vellore with their bioengineering and rehabilitation group. Uh, so in this case, in the grid model, you have two research institutions collaborating to uh, uh, do this work. And we have a new startup, Thira, which will uh, take some of our rehabilitation products to the market. So let me play a video about Pluto. So Pluto, all the components of Pluto can be enclosed in a suitcase. It fits into a suitcase. It's a compact design, which will fit into a small area. It's easy to carry and set up because everything fits into a box. Um, then you just, it can be easily, you select the mechanism to train, you plug it and you start playing it. That's why it's called a plug and train uh, robot. And we have different passive mechanisms, uh, one for wrist flexion extension, forearm pronation, supination, hand opening, closing, and functional things like key pinch. And the thing is, this rehabilitation is gamified. So it's not boring for the person to be uh, doing the therapy. And the there is the motorized rehabilitation, the controller provides assistance as needed. So it can be done in active mode or in passive mode or in an assist as needed uh, mode. Uh, and, the, and the games also adjust to how the person is playing them. The level of difficulty automatically adjusts uh, so that it challenges the person as they're doing the therapy. Data is collected from the therapy, which gives the clinicians quantitative, um, quantitative assessments, quantitative feedback about the progress of the user. With Pluto, we have now tested it in over, uh, as of now, actually, we have, uh, uh, I think, about nine centers across India have used Pluto. Uh, we've tested it with over a thousand patients. I need to update this slide. Um, and yeah, more than 50 clinicians have given us uh, feedback uh, over the course of the development. Um, and we have designed it for low resource settings. So here is a video where, you know, it's a very remote tribal village that we took Pluto to. Um, you know, they had very uh, little, uh, um, very choppy internet access, but they were still able to, we set up Pluto there. This person trained on it for six weeks. Um, you were, was able to use the games and there was, improvement because of the intensity of the therapy. There's significant research that shows that the intensity of the therapy matters when you are uh, when you're performing neuro rehabilitation. Uh, and so the game the combination of gamification and the ease of use makes it possible for people to use it for long periods of time. So over the years, we've developed several devices. We are still in the process of translating some of them to market. Some of them may just end up as open source designs because there's not uh, enough of a market for us uh, to be able to uh, uh, translate it into a viable business. Uh, so, but we are always looking at ways to, and that's one of the things, uh, the AT Open Innovation Portal is something that we are working on with GDI Hub. So we've also created um, many virtual resources for care, self-care after uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, that's a product, uh, sorry, that's a project called Touch Freedom. And we have a full, uh, the first release of Touch Freedom is a wheelchair skills training program, program where we have a series of about 80 videos, about five less than five minutes each, 
um, that focus on different, uh, right from the selection of a wheelchair to advanced skills, you know, uh, with a wheelchair that people can use and self-learn or learn with the help of uh, a therapist wherever they are in the world or with the help of a caregiver. Uh, so that's a resource that, and we will be creating more and more resources for self-care uh, for people with spinal cord injury. That's a project that we are doing with a partner uh, called the Ganga Foundation. Then we have also, uh, as I said, the new center, the National Center for Assistive Health Technologies focuses more on awareness creation and uh, um, you know, training programs for healthcare uh, professionals. We also have a wheelchair skills program. So people can do a physical wheelchair skills program. They can come to the center uh, and do that. Uh, and I will just play you a video about the wheelchair skills program. Wheelchair skills program transforming lives and empowering wheelchair users worldwide. A comprehensive program teaches essential skills from navigating uneven terrain and curbs to mastering ramps and public transportation. With the right training, wheelchair users can overcome obstacles and achieve greater freedom and confidence. At NCAT, in the center, we have created architectural barriers. We have created zones uh, which, uh, you know, replicate what they are likely to encounter in real life. Like we have a stretch of sand, we have a stretch of grass, we have stretch of potholes, uh, speed breakers, etc. So the participants come, they first learn these skills with our peer trainers, with our, uh, uh, under the supervision of our clinical team. And once they are confident, we take them out to the community. We take them on public transport, we take them to the mall, we take them to the beach. Uh, and so we build their confidence in uh, navigating uh, these uh, barriers in real life. I would like to thank all our collaborators. Um, we would not be where we are without the support, the funding that we have received from our many collaborators, um, uh, the NGOs and nonprofit organizations, because they are, are connect to the users in many cases, hospitals, other research, academic and research uh, institutions, and of course, the industry and startups uh, that we work with, um, uh, that our team works with because you know they form the, we are where we are because of uh, the help from all of them so i am now nearing the end of my presentation and uh, i would like to share with you the uh, msc program the slide on the disability design and innovation msc program at uh, gdi hub which is a master's degree blending research engineering and design to drive Disability Innovation for a Fairer World, apply now for September 2024.
It's a full-time program for a year. And uh, I think scholarships are also available. So thank you so much for this opportunity to present uh, some of our work to this uh, community. Thank you all for joining. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. I hope I stuck to my time. You did. Thank you so much, Sujatha. I always enjoy listening to your presentations and, and hearing about the ways you and your teams are applying innovative solutions to everything from prosthetics, mobility and rehabilitation. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank um, you. We've had lots of questions coming in. Thanks, everyone, who's put their questions to us. We'll try our best to get through as many of them as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the beginning. So question number one, how do people move around while being in the standing form of the wheelchair? Uh, the standing wheelchair in its current form is not designed to be moved around in it, when somebody is standing. That was mainly for safety reasons because, you know, they, as I repeatedly said during my presentation, uh, the terrain that we normally encounter is not very even. And therefore it could be a significant safety issue if we allowed people to move in the standing position. Uh, and therefore this version of the standing wheelchair does not have that. Thank you. We might, we might, we have a new version coming up where you could move around in a semi-standing position where you still have some control. We know it's a little bit more stable when you're in that position, but that's, it's a preview of coming attractions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, on to our second question, um, asking about co-creation. You've mentioned it several times and this uh, question wants to uh, know what methods of co-creation you use and what barriers there were. Okay, um, so the, the primary method of co-creation is that we have people on staff who are wheelchair users. So they engineers are constantly interacting with them. Some of them, um, you know, the, our uh, head of operations is a wheelchair user. He is the CEO of our new startup. So they are leaders. So we, our co-creators are also leaders and decision makers. And in fact, NCAT, this whole center that we, uh, it was conceptualized and created, you know, and co-created because we have clinicians on staff, as I mentioned, and we have several wheelchair users. So the entire, you know, we didn't, we just told the architect what to do, basically. It was conceptualized by our team of uh, uh, wheelchair users, uh, clinicians, you know, who have, who knew, for, for, for instance, like we have ramps with different gradients in the center to give people the experience that, yes, you know, according to the standard, you'll probably encounter a one is to 12 ramp, but you may not always encounter that. And so how do you navigate that? So th this is a lot of people putting their lived experiences, their experiences with people with disability, putting all those together to uh, create the center. So I think that's where, um, uh, you know, we are, that's probably been, of course, not all, um, uh, users can articulate their needs very clearly. You know, that's always a challenge. So being able to interpret what they are saying and converting that into a need is always a challenge. Okay. Uh, the, the team that works in our center, you know, it's much easier communicating with them because they understand what's going on. But when we have, uh, when we have uh, uh, other users coming in, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. The communication becomes a little bit more difficult. Right. And sometimes language barriers also play a part uh, in our country because we have, I don't know, 30 different languages, uh, even official languages, and then some more, uh, many more dialects and whatnot. So it's always a challenge. That's, a, that's been a challenge. Thank you, Sajak. Can I ask you to stop sharing your screen while I move on to the next question, 
which is, have you thought of um, standing powered wheelchairs and are these chairs available worldwide? Again, the standing powered wheelchair is coming up. So we have also given, now that Neomotion is doing well, uh, the original team of Neomotion was actually, so uh, we learned the journey doing the standing wheelchair, you know, working on the standing wheelchair project. And that's how we were able to um, uh, uh, get Neomotion out of this, uh, uh, you know, our first startup uh, from R to D two. So now that Neomotion is you know, sort of established, we've also given the uh, a license to them to produce the standing wheelchair. But we are doing a powered standing wheelchair this time. So the standing alone is powered. It's still a manual wheelchair, but it's a standing. Uh, it's a powered uh, uh, wheelchair. And it will also allow some level of uh, movement in the semi-standing position. Right. So brilliant. But that's and, and we hope to and we hope to get. So one of the things we want to work with the GDI hub is to collect evidence in other in places other than India. Right. We want to prove that these designs work in other places as well, and we need to work with the um, partners internationally to. Uh, collect this evidence, and then we will be able to, you know, meet certification requirements and uh, help these products come to market globally. Because we believe that, you know, these are products that would be of use globally. Okay. Well, speaking of Neo Motion, that takes me nicely onto my next question, uh, which is, what does the Neo Motion use as fuel, or in other words, how sustainable is the Neo Motion device? So the wheelchair by itself is a manually operated device. Uh, the add-on is battery operated. Right, thank you. Uh, again, Neomotion, is it a non-profit based company? Uh, no, it's not. It's not, non uh, it's, it's not a non-profit uh, company. Um, it's, it's a for-profit company, uh, but it's a very difficult market. AT is a very difficult market. So, uh, it's, it's not uh, because it's a very fragmented market. It's a very price sensitive market, uh, uh, especially in India, because most people uh, who have a disability either started off poor or they become poor after a disability because uh, they lose their means to a livelihood because they lack transportation to go to their workplace or their workplaces are not accessible. Uh, Etc. So uh, it's a for-profit company, but uh, you know, it's. I think ultimately, whether it's for-profit or not for-profit, it comes down to whether it's a sustainable business. If they're run efficiently, uh, you know, they they don't have a large profit margin. They have, uh, but they are now they've now figured out how to run in a lean manner, and uh, uh, so that they can be sustainable. Great. So I think profit by itself is not a bad word. It's when it's unfettered that it causes uh, problems. Agreed. Businesses have to be sustainable. Yeah. Well, with finances in mind, and um, the next question is asking about the average cost for the production of Neo Motion. Is that something that you can share with us? Uh, the I can share with you the average price. Mm -hmm. uh, the price is. Uh, a thousand pounds okay. for the whole uh, yeah device. That's the price uh, in India. Well, it's just, um, uh, next question is what material is the prosthetic knee made from um, as making it iron um, or aluminium? In yeah, it's a combination of road. aluminium. Yeah, it's a combination of aluminium uh, stainless steel, yeah, those are the, uh, and a few plastic parts uh, for like the kneecap. It's high strength aluminum and stainless steel. Yeah, um, uh, I've got another question here that um, the majority of the AT users featured in the video appear to be masculine presenting. Have you noticed a gender divide or could you speak about the role of gender alongside other social factors? Sure, sure. 
So um, if you looked at uh, our uh, wheelchair skills program, you can see that, you know, in, in, in among our peer trainers, we do have, uh, 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 we do have one woman peer trainer. We have two male peer trainers, uh, but we've seen more women coming for our wheelchair skills program. I think the challenges, if, if you think a man has challenges once they have a disability, I think women have twice, twice or more number of times the challenges. Um, because in general, um, I would say that they, they are seen as a burden. They're seen as a burden. Uh, and therefore, the, um, the family is less inclined to invest in assistive devices uh, for them. Um, so it, it's a problem with, for all people with disability, but with women, it becomes even more so. You know, we've had um, women whose partners leave them after they've had their disability and they don't have a means of livelihood. So it's very difficult to convince them to come to a program for like, you know, like a three week program or to have to uh, ensure that they are provided with these sort of uh, devices. But we are making an effort. So we now pitch to some of the uh, our donors that for instance, we want to give a certain number of the wheelchairs to women. Uh, we now have women who are uh, now returned to uh, means of livelihood. They, are, uh, they act as last mile delivery uh, people using say the Neobolt. So we have a lot of women, people with disability in general, you don't see them out and about a lot in India because the roads are so inaccessible. Places are so inaccessible. So most of them are confined to the walls of their home. And so to get them out of that and you know, to find them, to give them a device, all that presents challenges. And I think it's even more so when there is, uh, uh, you know, with, in the case of women. So therefore, yes, you see more men, but we are working to change that. If you saw in the uh, uh, wheelchair skills program, video or uh, the NCAT video, you will see that we are actively trying to uh, get more women to come to our programs because we know what a difference it makes. And we are actually working on a study now which focuses only on female wheelchair users. And we want to see how these devices can improve their quality of life. We want to present evidence that will convince people that this is a cause worth pursuing. Great, thank you. And um, again, another question around cost and maintenance for its durability. Have you had any feedback on its usage in rural areas where the terrains may be either mountainous or sandy? Uh, and are there any plans to export them? Yes, so these have been um, new motions devices are in use across all across India. So at least one device in every state. I would say so. And if you know anything about India, it, it, different areas are very, very different in terms of the uh, weather, in terms of uh, the geography, etc. So it's it's been, you know, it's been tested, and it's been in use now for about three years. So uh, we also have a maintenance program that is quite innovative in the sense that every wheelchair gets shipped with a small toolkit. And when somebody has a problem, okay, the first thing the team gets on a call with the support uh, uh, staff at Neomotion, they try to figure out what could be the problem. If it's a part that needs replacement, they can ship the part out. And they also send, send them a language agnostic video that shows them how they could do it yourself do DYI maintenance. So it could be, they could do it, their uh, caregiver could do it, or they could take it to a nearby, you know, or have somebody who's uh, more uh, mechanically inclined, so to speak, uh, help them 
do it. But it's not something where they have to be, you know, they have to send the wheelchair back or they have to be without their device for months on end because it has to be repaired. So this model has worked really well for them. So they just ship out the replacement parts. They have replacement parts for everything and they ship it out and they help the person do the repairs themselves. Right. And yes, there are plans to export it because, uh, yeah, I think access to global markets will make it uh, available to more people. And, and our goal is really more assistive technologies in use worldwide. People with disability are there everywhere. And we believe that these devices could be helpful everywhere. Thank you. Uh, the next one is more of a comment than a question. Um, they say that uh, while they appreciate the health benefits of being vertical, they're not so sure there's any relevance to self-esteem. And I wondered if you wanted to comment on, on that. Um, I guess it's a matter of opinion uh, because we've had users who, uh, and also possibly the environment that people operate in, uh, so in India, for instance, a lot of the switches are located um, at higher levels, right? Um, you have bookcases that you may want to access or, you know, you. so there is a lot of functional benefits. And when they are more independent, uh, it also improves their self-esteem. And the self-esteem thing is also mentioned in that uh, white paper that I talked about from Resna. Um, th that's something that they also mentioned that uh, there are people who've reported that if they want to say give a lecture, they feel better if they are standing and doing it just as any other person would, for instance. Or if they are in a room full of people who are standing, they don't want to be the only one sitting in a wheelchair because they kind of feel like they're being talked down to. So there are, uh, you know, there is research and there are, uh, I guess, anecdotal evidence where people say that uh, it improves their self-esteem. During the launch of our standing wheelchair, um, you know, I had the MC announce that we told people at the end of uh, uh, every function in India, we play the national anthem. So I told the MC, just say, you know, there were so many wheelchair users in the audience. So I said, just say, please get ready for the national anthem. Don't say, please stand up for the national anthem. But there were like five users on the stage, on the dais, and um, they stood up in their standing wheelchairs for possibly the first time after their injury. And they just felt very emotional about it. And so, you know, it's, it's a matter of opinion if, uh, uh, so yeah, I. No, no, thank you for, for doing that. We've got one minute to, to go. So where can people find out more information? Obviously they can subscribe to our newsletter and I'll put the details. R2D2, the, our webpage, r2d2.iatm.ac.in. Um, so uh, you can just Google R2D2 IIT Madras. Uh, we are now on, uh, uh, we have a YouTube channel, we are on Instagram, we are on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know, what else? I think that's, I, I'm not a social media person, but I do believe our team has accounts on all of these. So please subscribe to all these uh, and uh, we'll keep posting updates on that. So uh, I hope, uh, yeah, Brilliant. we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. There's still lots of questions, um, but if you subscribe to our newsletter, one of my team will put that in the chat for you. Um, we'll be able to keep you updated on what GDI Hub are doing and also to notify you about another disability innovation lecture that we've got coming up on Thursday, the 23rd of November. That will be with Dr. Rosie Gowron, who is a Associate Professor in Occupational Therapy. So that'll be a really good one to um, join us for as well. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. And thank you so much once again, Sajatha, 
Always a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Very Thank you for pleasure. the opportunity and for the wonderful questions. I'm happy if, is there, if you've uh, kind of recorded the other questions, I'm happy to uh, respond um, to them over email or something. You know, I can just type in my responses and send it to you and you can pass them on. I'm happy to do that. Thank you for all the interactions. <laughs> I really enjoyed. This. Me too. Thanks so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you.